This is a fascinating gospel story. And it clearly was very important in the early church, for it appears in Matthew, Mark, and in Luke. So it's told and retold in the early church with some real meaning and teaching. Before we begin to discuss it, we should set one or two things aside. It has nothing to do with the separation of church and state. I mean, some people have taken this to mean that one Caesar represents a state and Jesus the church. It's got nothing to do with religion and civil life. However, it has an extraordinary teaching in it, and I'd like to discuss that in these few words of homily. It's a census tax paid to the emperor resented very much by the Jewish people. Show me the coin. It had to be paid in Roman currency. Show me the coin. It's amazing that they had the coin since they resented the tax so much. And when they gave him the coin, he looked at it and he says, whose image is this? and whose inscription. Now, there's a powerful, subtle point here which is very easy to miss. And they said, Caesar's image. And the inscription was in Latin, and it says, Tiberius Caesar, Divi Augustus, Augusti, Divi Augusti, Filius Augustus, Pontifex Maximus. What it says is that Caesar is the son of the divine Augustus, Divi Augustus. He is the august son of the divine. He is the son of the god, Augustus. And interestingly, Pontifus Maximus, which was a tight part of the title of the emperor, later on in the, when we're coming to the end of the empire, the end of the fourth century, that title, rather interestingly, will come to the Pope. And even to this day, we still re refer to the Pope as Pontifex Maximus, the supreme pontiff. That originally was attached to the emperor. What's very important here is that should we listen to Caesar, the son of God, Augustus, or should we listen to the carpenter from Nazareth, the powerful one or the servant one? The one from Nazareth, Jesus Christ, the son of God. To whom should we listen? To whom should we pay tribute? Which is the dominant presence in our lives? Caesar or Jesus Christ? So let me look at this. This becomes the powerful teaching of the story. To whom should we listen? To whom should we pay the ultimate tribute? to the power of the world or to the power of Jesus Christ? Let me walk through this to discover a profound defining teaching. When I first went to the seminary, I was 18 years old. And before we did theology, we had to do philosophy. Philosophy was very important. I didn't know it at the time, but now what I know about philosophy now makes it fundamentally important before you can study any theology. The word philosophy comes from philane, sophia, which means lover of wisdom or to love wisdom. And there are various branches of philosophy. We began with epistemology. And then you go to metaphysics and logic and the various 
kinds or branches of philosophy. Epistemology, I didn't understand it. And after we finished the course, I probably knew less about it. But subsequently, I began to discover epistemology is very, very important as a fundamental understanding of who we are, how we acquire knowledge. It has to do with the process, not what you know, but how you came to know it. It has to do with the substance, the nature, the quality, the origin, the integrity of knowledge. The knowledge which guides every one of us. It is so fundamental, you can see how it's terribly important in life. Where are our biases? The source of our information that will confirm the integrity of our knowledge. It will affect the quality of our lives, the manner in which we interpret everything has to do with epistemology. Now, Richard Rohr, in his recent book, The Wisdom Pattern, discusses this. And he outlines seven different manners of acquiring knowledge. And wonders which one is dominant. And he deals with the intellect, the emotions, instincts, and so forth. Somewhat complex. Paul Tillich is easier to grasp. In his systematic theology, Paul Tillich, this extraordinary theologian, frames it this way. There are three levels of interpreting truth and a way of life. The first one is heteronomy. The Greek word nomos means way. Heteronomy is the uncritical submission to an outside authority. Uncritical submission to legalism, the language of the establishment. This was very much the manner of the Pharisees. The Pharisees discussed keeping laws. Keeping the law is the manner in which you will discover the truth, the manner in which you should be guided in your life, the uncritical submission to an outside authority. The second level that Tillich speaks about is autonomy. That's not unusual for us today. Autonomy, the weakness is, it has no anchor. It tends to be existential. It tends to be here, there, and wherever I wish to go. There is no grounding in it if we submit merely to autonomy. The third one is theonomy, theos nomos. That means the source of my information and my guide in life is God. I am led in life somehow by my attachment to God. And this is the language of Jesus Christ. It's the language of relationship. It's not the language of law. The Pharisees and heteronomic people have a big sign, and it says, do not disturb. We're living the law. We're living in this box, the uncritical submission. So do not disturb us. But of course, Jesus disturbed them because Jesus was not speaking about the primacy of the law. He was speaking about the primacy of relationships and the conversation of Jesus is mystical. Therefore, it deals with mystery. The proclamation of Jesus is shrouded in mystery. In its origin, mystery is far more than something we can't understand. Mystery is a reality. 
that has so much truth in it, so much substance, that it is beyond words. Mystery is beyond words. It cannot be belittled by any description in words. Keep this in mind. Miracles are mystery. I don't know how they happen. They just happen. There are moments in life where we encounter mystery. The birth of a child. The first time the mother holds that child after the birth. There's so much ecstasy. No words can describe this moment of revelation. There is a God. When the child is born, for sure, there is a God. There's something mystical. There's a mystery about it. And if you go to the hospital, you'll see all these babies. And, the, but, and they look all the same from a distance. But you talk to the mother and say, no, no, they're not the same. Each is unique, a mystery. How this little person got to be so incredibly unique. Words cannot describe the sentiments, the tears, the joy, the ecstasy of a father or a mother who holds the baby for the first time. That's mystery. How the God-man, the creator of the world, the infinite God, could appear among us in his humanity, could walk with us in loneliness, could carry a cross, could suffer, who could be overcome by tears, who could feel abandonment, who could die and rise again. Mystery. This cannot be contained in mere words. All human experiences got this. For a parent, the death of a child, overwhelming sorrow cannot be described in words. I had a call last night from a mother whose elder son died about six weeks ago and now her next son is dying. He has terminal cancer and he's dying. How do you describe that? It's mystery. It's the language of God. It's mystery. It's beyond our understanding. It's not the language of Caesar. It's the language of God. This is not new. Go back to ancient Egypt and you'll find our hieroglyphics this language of ancient Egypt, the holy script of this language, they're dealing with life and death and the afterlife. Go to the Valley of the Kings, 1800 years before Christ, and you will see all sorts of images dealing with the meaning of life and what happens after we die. Punishment or glory. These are concepts that are shrouded in mystery. Symphonies and songs are written about mystery. The pain, the struggle, the joy, the sadness. It's a mystery which is part of life. Poets and artists have attempted to touch the margins of history, of mystery, just the margins, to invite us to take a second look and say, wow, there's something here beyond words. If you look at a Monet or a Rembrandt or a Van Gogh, and if you have the contemplative spirit 
to reflect on it. You must belong to it. Mysteries are not meant to be solved. Mysteries are meant to be shared. And therefore, you must enter into the symphony. You must belong to the tears or the joy of the song. You don't sing the song. The song comes from somewhere deep inside of you. It's who you are. It's the meaning of your life somehow caught in a place of mystery. It can appear to us in very simple forms if we are silent enough and quiet enough to take a second look. Look at creation. See the mystery of God revealing. There's a wonder. There's a beauty beyond explanation, beyond words. That's the language of God. And this can come to us in very pedestrian and maybe ordinary ways that might seem to be somewhat passing. Let me give you a personal example. I went on retreat this day for a day on Friday. I spent the day alone. We have a house for prayer, for the prayer of priests only in the Los Feliz area. House of prayer for priests. I went there. It's quiet, it's contemplative, it's silent. You can walk in the garden, you can sit in the chapel. Nothing will disturb you there. It's a mystical place. It's a place where you encounter mystery. I had decided when I went there that I'd like to make a confession of my life. So I happened to meet this Franciscan priest who was there. He came for a day of prayer too, and I said to him, I would like to make a confession if you have time. And he said, I have time. So we sat together in the chapel, and I went through the narrative of my life. The joys, the sadness, the struggles, the failures, the pains, the whole story of my life, my disappointments, my moments of depression, moments of questioning, moments of anxiety, and mystical times. Mystical times when I was blessed, when I was enriched, when I was enlightened. Somehow I was sustained by the mystery of God's presence. And I walk through all of this in confession. It wasn't so much that I was seeking the sacrament of penance. It was a moment to relive the narrative of my life and to discover the weaving of God. Everything that happened in my life, somehow God was present, the mysterious presence of the hand of God leading me, the hand of God carrying me, consoling me, the hand of God blessing me in moments of glory, the hand of God carrying me in moments of darkness or failure. And then I go back and begin to consider epistemology and say, where is the source of the meaning of my life? Where is truth? Do I listen to Caesar? Or Jesus Christ. Caesar will offer you a Faustian bargain. Jesus Christ will lead you into a place of true life, a secure place, a place of mystery, and yet a place of presence. 
to belong to the mysteries, the mysteries of life. God is present there. So to whom shall we pay tribute in life? Give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, but don't mortgage your life for Caesar. Give to God what belongs to God, and that will be the fundamental basis, the meaning of your life in your connection with the living God in Jesus Christ. You will find life, the fullness of life eternal life now and forever. Amen.